भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम ज्ञानतिमिनंद ज्ञानांजना शलाकय चक्षुरुमिम तस्म श्रीगुरव नम श्रीचैतन्य मनोवीष्ट स्थापित येन भूतले स्वयं रूप कदम दुराती स्वापदातिक वंदेह श्रीगुरो श्रीयुत पदकमल श्रीगुरून वैष्णवांश श्री सागृात सहगन रघुनाथ वित सजीव साइत सवदूत पिजन सहित कृष्ण चैतन्य श्रीराधाकृष्णपदन ललिता श्री विशाखान्ता हे कृष्ण करुणा सिंधो दीन बंधो जगतपते गोपेशा गोपिका कांत राधा कांत नमोस्तुते ताप्त कांचन गौरंगी राधे वृंदावनेश्वरी वृषभानुसुते देवी प्रणमा हरि प्रिय वाचकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम नमो विष्णुपदा कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सरस्वती देवी गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्य बारी पाश्चात देश तारिणे जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधर श्रीवास गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे Hare Krishna everyone. So, welcome to our study of nectar of devotion. So this week we'll do a quick review of chapter 7 primarily. Um and we began to discuss the 64 angas of vaidhi sadhana bhakti. And we see the first 5 anga Shila Prabhupada says the first 3 are the most important. of the angas and the first of the angas is that we must accept the shelter of a bona fide spiritual master and shila rupa goswami and prabhupad comments that the sequence of coming to the shelter of the guru of the spiritual master is first one accepts the futility of the material world and the process of sense enjoyment seeing it to have no hope for any kind of happiness or enjoyment and then that leads one to pursue a spiritual life that the spiritual life is the only answer by which one can get happiness and freedom from all the material suffering and that then propels one to find to seek out a guru to teach one the process of spiritual life so this is what brings us to the shelter of a bona fide spiritual master and then angas 2 3 4 5 all relate to the importance of the role of guru in our spiritual life to accept initiation the formal process of diksha very powerful and important for us to um serving the spiritual master uh with both faith and confidence the faith comes when we have understanding that the guru can help bring us out from this well of material existence and then following in the footsteps and finally uh inquiring about these principles one with intelligence must inquire so this is what we discussed last week so now we'll discuss this week chapter 8 and chapter 10 so in chapter 8 we begin to see that there are four types of anarthas The holy names they can bring us to Krishna prema by chanting the holy names the Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has established how they can establish pure unconditional love in our hearts. So what stops us on this road to Krishna prema? It is the anarthas. And Shila Bhakti Vinod Thakur explains that there are four types of anarthas, four categories: the weakness of the heart, one. Two, aparads or offenses. 
Three, material desires. And four, the illusion about spiritual knowledge. And so the, uh, there are four categories of anarthas. And the primary issue, the primary obstacle we face is the offenses of the aparads. So, Rupa Goswami is giving us in chapter 8, the uh, discussing the two specific uh, aparads of seva and nama. There are four types of offenses. Offenses against the worship of the deity. Offenses against the chanting of the holy names. Offenses against devotees. And offenses against ordinary people. And so chapter 8 discusses the seva nam uh, aparad and holy names or nama aparad. And um, of the two, seva aparad and nama aparad, the most or more dangerous is nama aparad. When we make offenses against the holy name, they cannot be counteracted. Almost impossible. Prabhupada says, but if one becomes an offender to the holy name of the Lord, then he has no chance of being delivered. So the offenses to the holy name are very dangerous. But if one confesses seva aparad, one by chanting can overcome those offenses. So these are the two that we'll discuss um, here in a little bit more detail. And this is number 19 in the list of 64 angas. For those who are following from chapter 6, this is number 19 that is being presented here. Okay. So, we saw many offenses that were explained here. And um, the common ones that we see, you know, bowing down while holding what, with one hand. Sometimes uh, we'll see very practical offenses here. And sometimes we go into the temple and we offer obeisances with our bead bag in our hand. And as you can see, to bow down with one hand, not using both hands, is actually an offense. We surrender with both hands, not holding one back hand. So we should be mindful of, you know, when we offer our obeisances, that we take out our hand from the bead bag. Um, offering obeisances um, silently. Uh, when we offer obeisances, when you enter the temple to Srila Prabhupada, we should recite uh, his pranam prayers. Uh, if you have taken initiation, you also recite your guru pranam prayers. So uh, one should, while offering obeisances, always offer some kind of prayer. And when offering obeisances to the deities, we also recite different prayers like that. Right? You know, there's an offense to talk in front of the deities about anything but Krishna. You know, if you go to see the President of the United States or some very famous person, very big person, and you just have started having random idle talks with the person you're with, not including that or about that person of visit, that would be considered rude or impolite. So similarly, in front of the deities, Krishna is standing there. Are we going to have some idle conversation? And so some of these are very, you know, Again, practical offenses that Rupa Goswami is guiding us against, you know, to praise anyone else in front of the deities. You might remember or see that in morning Mangalarti, we worship Tulsi Marani after the curtains are closed. Then Tulsi Arti is performed in the morning. So it is an offense to praise anyone in front of the deities, uh, to take prasad in front of the deities. Now, you know, there's an understanding that also prasad from that specific deity may be honored, but generally we don't eat in front of the deities. Uh, one does not praise themselves in front of the deities, you know, um, or praise oneself in front of the guru. You know, sometimes we want to tell the guru all the great things that we're doing, you know, out of enthusiasm. But actually, we, as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu guides us, we should present ourselves as dumb, a fool, number one. That's what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says. Why? Because then Guru will bestow mercy. If we know everything, then there will be no mercy. So, like that, it, uh, it's important. So, um, 
more of these, you know, putting your back to the deity. We should be very mindful that our back, we should never show our back to anybody as offensive, and certainly not the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Uh, and again, I'm just reading some of these offenses. There are many, many uh, listed, uh, but we're just uh, covering a few of them. Uh, passing air in the temple is an offense. Um, you know, we are considered in a contaminated space after evacuating, and so one should shower before rendering any kind of service uh, to the deities. Um, you know, stepping over to flowers in the temple. Sometimes we, you know, see flowers and we just walk right by them and unfortunately sometimes right over them. But stepping over the flowers, Srila Prabhupada explains, is an offense. Uh, entering the temple without knocking. Um, you know, criticizing somebody in front of the deity. So, so many different offenses are being given here. Um, and we should be mindful of them. These are, these are nice chapters to read periodically, just to remind ourselves of some of the things we may be doing inadvertently, uh, like offering obeisances with our bead bag in our hand. That I see a lot um, we should be mindful of. You know, some interesting or unique ones, you know, holding your ankles or knees with your hands in front of the deities. Um, you know, wearing red or blue garments, uh, offering flowers without fragrance. Um, yeah, so these are some, you know, kind of more specific ones. Um, but the key point is to understand that the Supreme Lord is residing there. We are in front of the Supreme Lord. We hold them in very high regard. You know, so some other guidance, you know, we don't tell lies or chastise others. We don't get into an argument about some mundane thing in front of the deities. You know, we don't cry piteously. Uh, about some of our own lamentations in front of the deities, or glorify somebody else. Right? So the point is that our bay behavior should recognize that we're in the company of the Supreme Lord. You know, how would we act if, you know, some very important person was there? You know, would we show our back to them? Would we engage in idle conversation? Would we pass air? Would we, you know, get into an argument? Would we glorify somebody else? No. So like this, a lot of these are very kind of common sense, but when we forget that actually Krishna is standing there, they start to feel like, wait, so many rules and regulations. But if we just keep reminding ourselves, this is the Supreme Lord standing here, how I should behave, then these offenses become very obvious. Um, one um, uh, comment that you know questions get here sometimes is some of the contradictions you know we say that uh, you know not to glorify the guru or anyone in front of the deities but then it's also an offense not to glorify the guru and in waves of devotion Maharaj gives this example you know what to do if the guru and you meet the guru in front of the deities now what to do so we have to understand the essential principle here which is to always remember Krishna. Okay? And these negative principles are the points to help us not forget Krishna. So these things to avoid, these, these aspects uh, contribute to us being forgetful of Krishna. So we are avoiding them so that we can always remember him. So in that way, you can connect the two by glorifying the Guru as a dear servant of Krishna, you are glorifying one of Krishna's dear children, and thus there will be no offense. So our consciousness should understand the overarching principle. You know, sometimes um, you are given prasad, maybe maha prasad from the altar, and there's a statement that one should immediately take maha prasad, not hesitate. So now what to do? Do I take it in front of the deities? So... If it's coming from that deity, it's actually enjoying that you may. Um, but we understand the consciousness of, of what's happening, right? So the final um, point is to um, fail to offer the best of one's means. You know, Krishna says, Patram Pushpam Falam Toyam. So do we say, okay, you know, I have so many means, but Krishna just said, a leaf. So I'll offer him a leaf or a fruit, or just a glass of water. The point is, there is no minimum standard, that whatever you can offer, you should offer. But it is an offense to offer something very simple to Krishna, 
and to enjoy very lavishly for us. No. So if you only have water, then give water. But if you have the means to give much more, you should give the best of your ability according to your means. So that is very important. Um, Krishna does not actually look at what we give. He looks at how much we keep for ourselves. That is what he is looking at. You know, in just a s simple mathematical terms, if you have 10 and you give Krishna 5, that is very nice. But if you have 30 and you give Krishna 10, which is better? If I'm giving 10 of 30 or 5 of 10? One may say, well, giving 10 is more than 5. But Krishna doesn't look at it that way. He looks and says, person giving 10 is keeping 20 for himself and giving me 10. Whereas the person giving 5 is only keeping 5 for himself and giving me 5. So Krishna doesn't look at the absolute terms. He looks according to our means. And Kulavisha Sridhar was a great example. He had very humble means, yet was giving 50% of very humble means to worship the Ganga with tulsi leaves. So it is not about how much we give, it is about how much we keep. That is the nature of this. So again, just some of the offenses uh, that are discussed in, in, in chapter 8 around seva aparad. So now we'll discuss this very important topic about the offenses to the holy names. Because the holy names of the Lord alone can eradicate all the sins of seva aparad. So we make some mistakes in our worship, in our seva. We take to the process of chanting. But one must be very careful because the nama aparad, there is no savior from. We must be very careful to avoid these offenses in the chanting. And that is why Srila Prabhupada established that in the morning program, we recite the ten offenses. And we should have these committed to memory. So we'll just discuss them, uh, each one briefly here, for the purpose of um, helping us remember this. And this is why we also chant the Panchatattva Mantra before chanting, to, to beg for forgiveness for any inadvertent Nama Aparad we make. So to, be, to gain some mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, to be able to access the holy names, and for forgiveness if we accidentally make some of these mistakes, then we can um, recover from them. So the offenses are, one, is to blaspheme a devotee is dedicate his lives to the propagation of the holy names of the Lord. So we know Vaishnava Prad is the mad elephant in the garden, the Hatta Matta, that one cannot recover from offenses to the devotee. Very, very dangerous just as an elephant can destroy a beautiful garden in a few moments. A single instance of Vaishnava Prad can destroy years and years of bhakti that we have tried to develop in the heart. So we must be very careful about this. Two is to consider the names of demigods like Lord Shiva, Lord Brahma to be equal to or independent of the holy names of Lord Vishnu. Prabhupada says, you know, sometimes take this process, oh, I can chant Kali Kali, or Durga, Durga, it's all the same. Pick a name of God and chant it. Is an offense to the holy names of the Lord. Three is to disobey the orders of the spiritual master. If we take initiation, we take the initiation for the purpose of receiving instruction and not to follow those instructions is an offense in chanting of the holy names. Four, to blaspheme the Vedic literature or literature in pursuance of the Vedic version. You know, this Shastra is meant for us to pursue spiritual perfection. And to blaspheme the Shastra is an offense. The fifth is to consider the chanting of the holy names to be imagination. We say, oh, just by chanting one can achieve Krishna Prema. But we don't have faith. We think that's exaggeration. The holy names must not be that potent that even they can overcome all of my impurities. No. To underestimate the glories of the holy names. That is an offense. Six is to give some interpretation on the holy names of the Lord. The holy names have no interpretation. 
we should simply chant and recite them. So to give some mundane or mental speculation of the holy names is an offense. Seventh, which is to commit sinful activities and the strength of chanting the holy names. Oh, I've, I've got this powerful process of chanting, so I'm going to commit some sinful activities. This of the ten offenses is, is arguably the most offensive. So we should be very careful not to think that, oh, I can just chant more to cover up my uh, intentional sinful activities. Um, eight, to consider the chanting Hare Krishna to be one of the auspicious rituals activities or offered the Vedas as fruitive activities, Karma Kanda. To think that the Karma Kanda processes are on the same platform as chanting the holy names. It is not. Again, just like number two, to consider all the names to be the same. That bhakti is on a superior platform to all the karma kanda ritualistic activities, which are meant for material sense gratification. So we should be very careful not to put them all into one bucket. Nine, to instruct a faithless person about the glories of the holy name. You know, this one is sometimes questioned, you know, how do we introduce a newcomer? We can introduce them to the holy names, just chant but we will not reveal the deeper inner meanings of that until they mature in their faith. Because they may come to an offensive state, and then we will take some share of their offenses. So instead, we simply engage them in chanting without explaining too many of the details. Right? Um, and then 10 is not have complete faith in chanting of the holy names, and to maintain material attachments. Those go hand in hand. If I have faith in the holy names, is giving me pure perfection of life, then I'll have no material attachments. My material attachments is a sign of my lack of faith. Right? And it also offends to be inattentive while chanting. So Prabhupada is guiding us here that one should be very careful to guard against these. So these are the ten offenses um, that one must uh, be very careful of in the chanting of the holy names. Every initiation lecture is given um, uh, great importance of this, um, of this process. So the chanting of the holy names is so powerful. It can alone, alone evoke Krishna Prema. It can deliver us from unlimited number of sins. Right? So we see um, Prabhupada quotes this, um, this verse that in the Vishnu Dharma, there's a statement glorifying this process of congregational chanting. Quote, My dear King, this word Krishna is so auspicious that anyone who chants this holy name immediately gets rid of the resultant action of sinful activities from many, many births. And that is a fact. There's a following statement in Chaitanya Charitamrita. A person who chants the holy names of Krishna once can counteract the result in actions of more sinful activities than he is able to perform. So the Maha Mantra can deliver us very easily. But because in our contaminated state, we need help. We are not so effective in our chanting. And so this is the purpose of all the other Angas of Bhakti. If only chanting is required, then what is the purpose of the other Angas, the 63 Angas of Bhakti? Well, first of all, to be able to chant properly, we need Guru to empower us. You know, when you take initiation, the spiritual master chants on your Japa Mala to empower those Japa Mala so that when we chant on them subsequently, we may receive some of that mercy. It's a very powerful uh, interaction between Guru and disciple. Each time we chant on our beads, we're directly associating with Guru who has empowered those beads personally. Sometimes after initiation, we forget about that potency that exists within those Japama. Um, but the point here is that all the Angas of Bhakti, of Sadhana Bhakti, are meant to help us to get us to chant better. The worship of the deities, the worship of Tulsi Marani, the application of Tilak, all these different things are meant to help us remember Krishna more so that we may take to the process of chanting. So we should understand as we do all these different angas, it is to bring us to the point of better chanting. Because chanting alone, as I read in this verse, is 
sufficient to awaken Krishna Prema. But to bring us to the point of good chanting, we perform these other angas of devotional service. And practically, this is very helpful for us because sometimes we wonder, you know, how to prioritize all the, you know, my different activities and different services. So we should remember this very carefully. That all the other services we do is for the point to bring us to good chanting. So we should not let our other services get in the way of attentive chanting. The chanting is the inner core. Everything else builds around that to enhance the inner core. And that core is this chanting of the holy names. So this should be very clear. And then as we see these other angas, these 63 angas, we should understand, how does this one bring me to better chanting? How does initiation take me to better chanting? How does inquiring from the guru bring me to better chanting? How does circambulating the deities bring me to better chanting? How does avoiding turning my back to the deities bring me to better chanting? So on and so forth. So let us not lose sight of this central core of our bhakti is the most potent holy names of the Lord. Sufficient to bring about Krishna Prema. But because of our aparads, primarily seva aparad and nama aparad, they, that serves as an obstacle, a roadblock on our path to Krishna Prema. So Rupa Goswami is guiding us how to remove these obstacles. We have to become aware of them and then move on. Right? So now we'll move back to the positive engagement. So we've discussed some of the things to avoid. And now in chapter 10, Rupa Goswami is presenting four more angas of Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti, angas 43 through 46. So we covered 20 through uh, 42 in chapter 9 last week. So in chapter 10, we see 43 through 46. And these are the hearing, expecting the Lord's mercy, remembering, and meditating. So we'll discuss these four now in a little bit of detail. So number 43 is the hearing. Hearing is the first step in Krishna consciousness. It is the key to our progress in spiritual life. Um, Srila Prabhupada comments in that paragraph that it is the powerful cleansing agent of the heart when we come in contact with the transcendental sound vibrations. These are not ordinary sound vibrations that are entering the ear. The transcendental sound vibrations can break away the dirt that has been caked into our heart for years and years and relieve us of that. Um, there's a beautiful prayer by King Prithu in, um, in Canto 4 of Srimad Bhagavatam where he explains that the, when the pure devotee speaks, it vibrates the saffron dust particles sitting on the lotus feet of the Lord. And those dust particles fly in the air and they enter into the ear of the recipient and reach the lotus heart of that hearer, of that person hearing. So this is the potency of, of, of hearing from the holy names, or hearing of, excuse me, from the pure devotee. So I'll, I'll um, read a couple of um, quotes that Srila Prabhupada presents here on, on, on page 90. The... Um, he gives the um, fourth canto, 29th uh, chapter, 40th verse. The importance of hearing of the pastimes of the Lord is stated by Shukadev Goswami to Maharaj Parikshit. My dear king, one should stay at a place where the great acharyas, the holy teachers, speak about transcendental activities of the Lord. And one should give oral reception to the nectarian river flowing from the moon-like faces of such great personalities. If someone eagerly continues to hear such transcendental sounds, then certainly he will become freed from all material hunger, thirst, fear, and lamentation, as well as all illusions of material existence. So this hearing process is very, very important. Um, Prithu Maharaj, in that same section of chapter 20, he wishes for a benediction of having millions of ears so that he may hear more. You know, we talked about the importance of 
uh, having some attraction to define our progress in spiritual life, attraction to bhakti. Well, the intensity of our hearing, how eager am I to hear, is a great indicator of how much progress I'm making in devotional life. Am I running to Srimad Bhagavatam class or am I running to the Prasad line? You know, where is my eagerness? But in order to have the f attraction to Srimad Bhagavatam, yeah, we first cleanse the heart by eating sumptuous Krishna Prasadam. But our goal is to become very enthusiastic to hear. Right? And Srila Prabhupada gives you know, the example of of, you know, s s uh, awakening a sleeping person, you know. When someone is sleeping, by making a sound, you can alert them to some danger. When we are sleeping, we lose all consciousness of who I am, where am I, who is next to me, what is happening around me. This is like us in the material world. We have lost all consciousness of who I really am. And so how to awaken that sleeping person? We make some sound. So like that. How to awaken the sleeping soul, Jiva Jago. How to awaken? By vibrating the transcendental sound vibrations into our ears. So by this process of hearing, Srila Prabhupada gives the example of the person who is unconscious by a snake bite. By chanting some mantras, one can revive that person. Similarly, by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, one can be awakened from their unconscious state of material attachment. So, so much emphasis is given here. Again, we'll read another one from the bottom of page uh, 90. This is coming from the 12th canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, verse 15. A person who desires unalloyed devotional service to Lord Krishna, who is praised by transcendental sound vibrations, should always hear about his glorification and transcendental qualities. This will certainly kill all kinds of inauspiciousness in the heart. So this hearing, again, is um, very, very powerful. And it, it, it said here in this verse, that will kill all kinds of inauspiciousness in the heart. Sometimes we lament our inarthas, the impurities in our heart. So how to kill them? By hearing about Krishna's names, forms, pastimes, and qualities. We'll see how hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, reciting Srimad Bhagavatam daily is one of the five most potent um, angas of Vaidhi Sadhana Bhakti. We'll see that a little bit later. So again, so much emphasis on hearing. And actually, there's a wonderful story of Srila Prabhupada in Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. When Srila Prabhupada went to see uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur on, during the Vrajamandal Parikrama, he had reached uh, in the early afternoon, uh, late afternoon, early evening time to the campsite. Um, and there the devotees had gathered and an announcement was made that there was going to be a, a tour to some local uh, r spiritual sites that devotees could go. Or they could stay back and hear a class by Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur. So their devotees were given the option. And most of the devotees went to take, you know, blessings from all the auspicious sites around the campsite that they had been taking rest in. Uh, but a few very senior devotees and Srila Prabhupada went for the class. And Bhakti Siddhanta Saras Thakur gave a very beautiful class. And Srila Prabhupada was not initiated at this time. So he was, you know, quite junior. Mostly Maharaj's uh, senior, uh, uh, sannyasi disciples were present and he was the lone non-initiated devotee at this time and the class was going and going and very beautiful and long discussion was taking place and slowly you know even some of the senior disciples had you know gone to attend to other duties or take rest but Srila Prabhupada stayed back and he stayed and very attentively heard the whole lecture several hours and so just a few days after that, Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur came to Allahabad. And there, where, that was where Srila Prabhupada at that time had his pharmacy business. And when the Gaudiya Mutt devotees there presented Srila Prabhupada as a candidate for initiation to Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur, he saw Srila Prabhupada. He said, oh yes, 
I have seen him. He likes to hear attentively. He is uh, hearing nicely, actually, he said. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sattakar was struck by Srila Prabhupada's enthusiasm to hear and knew that to be a very strong sign of this progress in devotional life and thus gave him um, initiation. And at that time, not only gave uh, first initiation, also gave him Brahman initiation, both at the same time. Um, and how so? By Srila Prabhupada's attachment to hearing. So this is the key, you know, to hear, chant, and remember. You know, this Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu Shmaranam. So number 44 is to expect the Lord's mercy. You know, this is a critical uh, for us as we encounter ups and downs in, in, in our spiritual life. Right? So in the 10th canto, 14th chapter, verse 8, it said, quote, My dear Lord, any person who is constantly awaiting your causeless mercy to be bestowed upon him, who goes on suffering the resultant actions of his past mis misdeeds, offering you respectful obeisances from the core of his heart, is surely eligible, eligible to become liberated, for it has become his rightful claim. Srila Prabhupada says that this statement of Srimad Bhagavatam should be the guide of all devotees. So this should be our consciousness. That, you know, when we encounter difficulties, you know, sometimes we want to blame God. Why are you letting this come in the way? I'm serving you so much. And this is how you respond? You know, we sometimes lose our perspective. But the right way to deal with the challenges that we face, the suffering is given in this 10th canto, 14th chapter. Constantly awaiting your causeless mercy, going on suffering the resultant actions, and offering respectful obeisances from the core. This is the formula. Right? We know that whatever I am receiving, it is due to my past karma only. But Krishna's mercy is with me. He is minimizing my suffering, and He will come and help me. And thus the devotee is very calm and composed in the midst of great difficulty. You know, this picture of Prahlad Maharaj. So much atrocities, yet he was simply Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu Shmananam. He had faith. Krishna will come and protect him. He is under the shelter of Krishna. Right? So the devotee sees, yes, my suffering is due to my past karma, but the Krishna will be there to protect me. So actually expecting the Lord's mercy to come is an anga of devotional service. Rupa Goswami also gives this you know, other aspect of weighing to look at this. Is it also to see the suffering it itself as Krishna's misery? You know, the devotee sees that if there was no suffering from my misdeeds, then what would be my incentive to avoid these misdeeds. I am so foolish, I cannot on my own see the path of Krishna consciousness. So that when I get my gentle slaps of suffering, it is Krishna's greatest blessing to remind me that I should take to the process of devotional service. So the devotee is grateful for their suffering because it reminds them, I shall stop all these activities which is leading to my suffering. And they are grateful because were it not for the suffering, what motivation we would have to regain our eternal relationship with Krishna. So this is the consciousness, you know, instead of blaming the Supreme Lord. Because sometimes we have this tendency, you know, either we're going to reject Krishna when we face difficulties, or we can expect Krishna's mercy to come and save us. Srila Prabhupada comments at the end of this paragraph, this Dayabak, referring to a son becoming the lawful inheritor of the property of the father. You know, as the son, you are the lawful inheritor of this property. Similarly, that one who is fixed in devotional service, a pure devotee who is undergoing all kinds of tribulations, expecting Krishna's mercy, they are lawfully, qualified to enter Goloka Vrindavan, the transcendental abode. It's a very powerful statement by Srila Prabhupada. He says, lawfully qualified, as if it must happen. 
But if one is practicing pure devotee, pure, pure devotional service, and undergoing all kinds of tribulations. And you can see in Srila Prabhupada's journey, so much difficulty he faced. He never gave up. So many setbacks. But he remained dedicated, overcoming all of them. The tribulations and uh, trials of the Pandavas, of Queen Kunti, of Mother Draupadi. So many obstacles we see. You know, Haridas Thakur being beaten in the marketplace, still being compassionate. You know, Prahlad Maharaj, so many tribulations, snakes and thrown from mountains and boulders and big elephants, but remained fixed. So this is the anga of, you know, expecting the Lord's mercy. So this puts us in the right mood and a positive attitude in all circumstances and can help us, you know, persevere through these different difficulties we may face. We should know the Lord's mercy is going to help us. Okay? So now, this remembering and meditation. So we know of the nine processes of devotional service. Vishnu Shmaranam is the third. So this remembering is very important. So, you know, what do we remember? So, we remember the things that we are attracted to. So, attraction starts with hearing. I hear about something and it leads to some attraction. I hear about the beautiful beaches of Hawaii and oh, some attraction. I hear about the glories of Gulab Jamun. Oh, some attraction. And when I have attraction for something, love for something, then I remember it. If I am, no, I'm going to have gulab jamuns after this class. Boy, it won't be difficult to remember gulab jamuns. They'll be in my consciousness. So how that attraction came though, it comes by hearing. So when we hear about Krishna, we, it increases our attraction for Him. And by increasing our attraction for Krishna, then naturally remembering occurs. We don't have to work to remember the things we are attached to. You know, if we're going on some nice vacation next week, we don't have to work to think about the beautiful place we'll be going to. Our whole consciousness will be swimming and meditating on this vacation. Because there's attraction. So how to bring ourselves to natural remembering of Krishna? We must increase our attraction. How to increase our attraction? It comes from hearing. So this is the process, the step. And that's why in the 8th verse of Nectar Instruction, we saw the essence of all advice is one should utilize one's full time, 24 hours a day, in chanting and remembering the Lord's names, forms, qualities, and eternal pastimes, right? So this is the critical process. Um, hearing is our key to remembering. And we won't constantly remember unless we are eager to hear. And Krishna gave us the benediction the, that at the end of our life, if we are remembering Krishna, we will go back to Him. That whatever you think of at the time of death, yam yam vipi smaram bhavam tejantate kalevaram, you will achieve. So if we are remembering Krishna, and then we'll go back to Him. So this sequence of remembering is very important. And meditation, the final langa that we'll discuss today, Similar to remembering, but more concentrated and intensified. And it is not idle meditation. It is meditation on Krishna's names, His forms, His pastimes, and His qualities. So we meditate on these four things. Right? And the point is that we are meditating on some aspect of Krishna. And Srila Prabhupada explains in very nice detail this pastime of the poor brahmana. That even meditating on a service 
is as potent as doing a service itself. Sometimes, in fact, we do a physical service for Krishna and we are meditating on something else. We are meditating on so many other, you know, random things. But actually, by just meditating on the service, it has the potency of actually doing the service. Because Krishna is not accepting our offering of chapati or sweet rice. He is ex accepting the consciousness, the love that went into that offering. Right? So the Brahmana did not blame Krishna for not being able to do service because he had no money or means, which he knew was only due to his past karma. At least that was his understanding. But still it didn't stop him. He simply performed his service with great meditation, performing Abhishek, rendering beautiful dressings and jewelries of the deities, and then cooking this very wonderful pot of sweet rice. So this meditation is a very potent form of service. So when we don't have means to do physical, we can render service through our heart. Again, the service comes from an expression of our love. It is not just a physical activity. Right? So these are the you know, four angas discussed very nicely in, in chapter 10. And so next week we'll continue discussing more of the different angas of devotional service. As we said, Rupa Goswami is presenting each and every one with Shastric principles to help us understand what to do. Okay, so any uh, comments or questions, discussion we can have? Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, you mentioned uh, that we should be wearing red and blue, is that true? <laughs> yeah. That true? Yeah, it, it's, it has some historical significance. It's not one that we have much good data or understanding of why. So, but we can understand one thing in our modern manufacturing of cloth, it is not, uh, not um, an offense today. There, there, there's some understanding that in the manufacturing of those two cloths, there was some impurities uh, in the dyes or something that's a kind of a speculation. So it is okay, you can wear blue and red in the temple. Any other comments or questions? Hare Krishna, Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. I was, I was wondering, um, in terms of when you talked about uh, offering obligations when you say the mantra for Shiva Prabhupada and in the temple, you say prayers, but I don't even know if they're correct. But what are the specific prayers for bowing in front of the deity? Which one? Yeah. Like general? Yeah. So, first of all, the prayers are correct if our mood is of prayer. So the, the, the mood of the prayer is more important than the actual mantra you recite. Because if you recite the mantra with perfect pronunciation, but you're like, man, why do I have to bow down? Well, then that prayer doesn't have value. So the mood is more important than the specific prayer. The mood is that I am offering my obeisances to you, my Supreme Lord and Master. Right. So when we offer our obeisances, it is a mood of surrender. And that should be our consciousness. But, so the etiquette is that when you come into the temple, you offer your pranams to Srila Prabhupada, and you chant the Guru Pranam prayers. When you come in front of Gornitai, you again chant Guru Pranam prayers. Again, this is, this is one way to do it. There are other ways to do it also, so don't take this as absolute, but this is one way. And then you chant the prayers glorifying Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Then the Mo Mahavadanaya Krishna Prema Padayate Krishna Krishna Chaitanya Namne Goda Twishinama. You can chant those. You can also chant the Mul Mantras for each of the deities, um, which are offered in the worship manual. And then when you go in front of Radha Kunj Vihari or Radha Krishna, whatever your local temple may be, you you know offer the prayers of again Guru Pranam and then Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmanitai Chajagatitai Krishnaya Govindaya Namo Namaha. 
offering and glorifying Krishna. And you can offer that same prayer to Lord Jagannath, uh, Balde, Mother Subhadra. But again, you can also chant the Mool Mantras for each of those deities. Um, so, you know, based on your desire. But you know, the, the, the simplest way is to offer Guru Pranam and then Namo Mahavadaniya prayers or Namo Brahmanya Devaya prayers. But you can offer any prayer. It can be, um, you know, a mo the, the point is to have the mood of, you know, offering your obeisances and glorifying the Lord. Um, and so that is the, the, the point. But that is one way in which you can um, offer uh, your obeisances in the temple. Any other surprising offenses or surprising injunctions here? Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Prabhu. So, um, sometimes, uh, you know, bro, like we might be like kind of forced to do certain things and uh, at that time, uh, really have the mood have that love, uh, but we still do it. Yep. Yep. Is that any yeah. offense? Please? No, uh, that, that's Vaidhi Sadhana, right? We're in Vaidhi Sadhana. So we do these things not because they're necessarily natural to us, but we do them because it's a Shastric scriptural injunction. Right? So it's okay. That, that We're in a training process. Our point is to try to develop the mood of natural. That is the next step, Raghunaga Sadhana Bhakti from this point. But remember, these are the Angas from Vaidhi Sadhana. So this is the point, that because our mood is not yet uh, purified, we look to external impetus, external uh, inspiration to follow. And that external inspiration is Guru and Shastra. Okay? So yeah, we may not, you know, uh, be naturally inclined to some of these principles, but we still follow them because we know they're the right rules. So we study them, we learn them, and then we follow them. So that is the the understanding. So don't worry if they're not natural yet. That is why we are in Vaidhi Sanana Bhakti. Sure, bro. Um, so the follow-up question on that is, so it's not only that it's not natural, it's not like I am uh, I'm uh, I'm doing it because um, because I I am naturally inclined, but more like if we have like especially if we have the thought that I really don't want to do it, uh, but I'm just doing it. Is that still okay, bro? Well, Prabhupada said, "Fake it till you make." It. That's my question. Prabhupada said, "Fake it till you make it." <laughs> okay. Yeah, we should do it. But we should then become understand why I don't want to do it, you know. And we the reason Rupa Goswami is giving us, he could have stopped at chapter 6, right? And just said, do all these things. But what he's doing now is giving us the reasons why. So if there's something that I'm being told to do that I'm doing just because I don't want to, you know, you know, upset people or I don't want to stand out, okay, that's fine. Do it. But then search out, well, why are we doing this? Right, because we don't want to follow things totally blindly. We may for some period of time, out of faith that overall, this is the right thing to do. But if I have this hesitation, you know, I don't want to offer my obeisances. Why do I have to offer my obeisances so many times? Just once is enough. Okay, still do it, but then inquire, like, you know, why, what is the purpose? Why am I doing this? So Rupa Goswami is giving us many of the whys. What's the importance? You know, why do I have to come and observe Arti? You know, I want to come later. So he's giving us the benediction one achieves from Skanda Purana. So like that, you know, we can start to inquire because there's a reason for everything. Everything that we do, there's a strong reason behind it. It's not just blind rituals. Thank you, bro. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions or comments today? Uh, Hare Krishna, Prabhuji, Dhamsa. Hello, Pranav. Uh, 
Prabhu Ji, I just want to ask, uh, there's a question in the homework uh, which says, uh, how do we explain that uh, meditation and bhakti to the newcomers? So can you explain on that part, please? How do we um, explain meditation and bhakti for newcomers? Yeah. So there's, you know, d d different aspects of, of, of that. Um, because sometimes when we, you know, the, the common misconception on meditation is this kind of idle, you know, emptying the mind, this Mayavad or Buddhist mentality. So, um, you know, we explain to them about what meditation really is, uh, about meditating on these names, forms, pastimes, and qualities. And ultimately, the most powerful meditation is this mantra meditation, right? So it's an active engagement. And that's what Srila Prabhupada speaks a lot about in this purport, um, is that, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's not an idle meditation, but it's an active meditation. So those who are new. And then the other side of that also is that, you know, sometimes people think, well, I don't have to, you know, I don't have to do anything for Krishna. I'm just doing it in my mind. You know, I'm just thinking about Krishna all the time. I don't have to chant. Well, that's also... Um, you know, not a viable path of success because the physical activities is what then brings the emotional side with it. Uh, once you reach a very powerful state, yeah, then, you know, you may do mana seva. Right? So those are kind of two aspects of that. And you can explore that a little bit further on your own. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. One more question. Yes. About um, one of the envelopes that you mentioned, the holding of the knees in the temple room. Yes. When we have lectures in the temple room, and sometimes sitting there listening to lectures, we are still in the temple room. Are we not supposed to hold our knees then? Yeah. I mean, technically, you shouldn't. Um, and it uh, again, I. I you with it or something like that I can say so but technically we should not so we can try not to um, and sometimes you know you can just put your knees up but not hold them uh, as a means to you know <laughs> uh, ease the legs falling asleep syndrome that happens um, so yeah that's something that uh, we can try yeah we we be practical um, you know some of the other symptoms, you know, we don't lie down in front of deities, we don't put our feet towards the deities, spread our legs in front of the deities, those sorts of things. You know, what's the actual issue with holding the knees or ankles? I'm, I'm not exactly sure. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that was a surprising one. Yeah, <laughs> it is. The one that I am hearing right now. So. <laughs> yeah, you do the best you can. Again, but more importantly, if you're sitting in a lecture, is to hear. So if we have to ease some body pain, we got to do what we need to do because, again, the great importance of hearing is so vividly described here. And, you know, one other comment I'll make on hearing is that, you know, we should hear attentively. Um, too often, you know, we hear inattentively. You know, sometimes we're more conscious of chanting attentively because we speak about it, but we should hear attentively. Um, it's okay to hear, I have idle hearing, but we should make sure that we have at least a little bit of good attentive hearing. Um, and that's, you know, some of the classes that we attend or bhakti rikshas. It's nice, you know, we may be listening to lectures while driving to work or while going for a walk or, you know, while cooking and things. And that's good. It's better than hearing mundane topics. But we should try to bring into our you know, daily sadhana, some good attentive hearing. And part of hearing is reading. Reading is included within hearing. So between reading and hearing something, you know, focus on attentively doing it. It will increase its potency. So exactly. sometimes we under, you know, emphasize this attentive hearing, but it's an important part of our bhakti. Just a side point, uh, not directly related to your question.
thank you Mataji for your questions. Any other uh, questions or comments today? Yes, Prabhu? Uh, in, the, in, the, in the beginning of chapter 8, uh, you mentioned the four anarthas, right, Prabhu? Can you please repeat them one more time? I just, I just want to make a note. Yeah, so there are four categories of anarthas. The weaknesses of the heart, the um, upper odds, and I can put it back on the screen for you too. Um, the, the, we, we, sorry, the, the weaknesses of the hearts, the uh, upper odds, having material desires, and the illusions about spiritual knowledge. So, yeah, and then there are some subcategories there uh, within each. You know, what are some of the different weaknesses of the hearts? What are the four aparas we talked about? So, Bhaktivinoda Thakur has, has kind of explained this nicely. Um, 